Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Good morning, everybody. A milder, smoother band this morning. That's right. It's more, you know, interpretive or, or something. It gives us a moment, an opportunity to express ourselves differently than normal. We, we get to show a more sensitive side of ourselves. I didn't use the other word. But anyway. <laughs> the other S word. Here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, nothing bad about that S word, gang. It's just an inside joke from the from the um, from the. Green the room. The green room banter can sometimes get a little crazy. Mm. <laughs> it can get out of hand. It can. <laughs> Not hey, even look a... to everybody. Yeah. Well, got all that weather coming in. Oh, yeah. Chad's saying it's cold in Tucson, and you were saying you had um, you had frost on the on we the had, water bowls for your animals we had this morning. Freezing stuff last night. Yeah, which is mm-hmm. crazy for April. Yeah, and uh, we got freezing stuff here in eastern Ontario. Uh, a late spring uh, rainstorm, ice storm coming through. So yeah, lots of uh, lots of fun going on. Good times, indeed. indeed and uh, good morning from uh, Nebraska. My daughter's up there going to law school, so it's good to good to hear from that side of the world. Oops, I got to better get rid of that uh, <laughs> before another video starts to play that we don't want. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Boy, that'll happen. Well, hey, heck, you know, we've got a great show again today. It's Wednesday. That means it's Idiotic Day. And Chris, who's our guest today? Well, gang, we have Susie Miller back with us. Um, Susie, you have been here before, but uh-huh. there's probably folks who haven't met you yet. So, so introduce yourself to the gang that's uh, that's joining us here in the chat today. Okay. So uh, my name is Susie Miller. I'm joining you from um, Winchester in the UK. And um, my background really has been as long as I could remember in learning and development. So started off like many te- uh, many people as a, a classroom teacher, and then I moved into um, working, um, doing lots of um, IT training, and then moved into becoming an instructional designer and developer. And that's when I started becoming particularly interested in accessibility, which is what led me to um, write a book, which is called Designing Accessible <laughs> Learning. <laughs> and folks, we will, of course, throw some links in uh, as we go along to the book if people want to um, explore that, explore that some further. I, and I, I don't know if you've got a copy within reach, but fun to th- flash it across the screen too, just so people I usually can show it upside down, but, but there we yeah. have it. Nope. So. There we go. <laughs> Perfectly done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Um, and so we are talking about accessibility. Um, yeah here today and we, we've had okay. that you, you've joined us you know for another session you know on a similar sort of a topic um but i think what we're 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 kind of broadening it a bit more from sort of the standard w cag or, or what what often gets thought of as the as the granular to, to something you know a bit more broader for diversity um okay. and, and inclusion as a as a, a bit sort of a higher level or a broader kind of uh explanation you know people hear accessibility and they do think about um I guess some certain things that pop into mind, whether that's, um, I don't know, folks maybe have to use a keyboard, you know, to navigate some content, et cetera. But um, there are also lots of, um, you know, hidden disabilities or hidden, uh, you, know, you know, things that affect how people can, you know, access, access content and understand it and work with it. Uh-huh. So um, you want to maybe walk us through some of, some of those things that we don't think of top of mind? Yeah, so I think uh, the the idea about accessibility is if if you kind of break it down. So when you're trying to make sense of accessibility, one of the things that I found particularly helpful when I was start getting started is just being quite clear about the different types of access needs. So if you kind of break those down into vision, um, hearing, mode. So I think it's it's a kind of a you know, within each of those groups, there is a whole range of different um, conditions and, and disabilities and access needs that, that affect people. So not only are they um, permanent disabilities, but also 
I think we've, we've talked before about the fact that it also that this idea of situational and temporary um, access needs as well. So it kind of affects the, the broad range of, of, of all of our learners, really. But I can go into more detail about any mm -hmm. particular. I know you said about mm -hmm. keyboard access, but uh, that's, a, that's a general and broad overview, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, even uh, I'm, I'm wearing my accessibility devices. Do you know what's happened is in the last couple of weeks, I've realized that I need the bloody reading glasses just to see my laptop screen, which is yeah. new. I didn't, yeah. you know, typically need them on a daily basis looking at the screen yeah. yet. But yeah, so, so you're, and, you're and, a great example of, of making sure that if we're creating learning content, then we're basically future proofing it for all of our learners because, you know, as our learners, you know, develop and change over time, then, you know, their access needs will also change. So it's one of the great things I think about making learning content accessible is that you do, um, as I say, that great idea of future proofing it for, for anything that's going to happen in the future to your staff. Yeah, I think as you're describing that, there, I think of, um, I, I'm going to call it a cartoon, but it wasn't meant to be super humorous, but the, you know, the idea of there's the stairs to the building and then the ramps off to the side. But what if instead of that, you actually just built a ramp and everybody used the ramp? Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Regardless uh, in, in that, and because it, still, it still benefits everybody. Definitely, so. definitely. And I think that's, that's hugely, hugely um, important for learning. I think this idea that you know that we still have in our industry that um, you know you have you have the exciting and the the kind of interactive the engaging learning and then you have the accessible version I think <laughs> we're still battling that in in our industry and I think you know if we if we have a change in mindset it really does become clear that actually accessible learning is better for everybody mm -hmm. I do have um, personal recollections of projects where there was a requirement to provide a text-based version of the content exactly. for folks who, exactly. you know, and yeah, I mean, how how helpful is that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, and actually, that sometimes working with organisations, we do still see that some mm -hmm. organisations prefer to, still to do that. Obviously, that we've moved on from there, and the actual learning itself it, it is as, as accessible as we can get it to be. But they still think that actually it can be valuable for some people to have a text-based alternative, as long as that isn't mm -hmm. kind of seen as the accessible version. Uh, and you know, you know, you either have the the, the you know, as I say, the, the all bells and whistles interactive, or, or you have the kind of you know the the text-based version for, for anyone who has any access needs. It, it sort of feels in 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 my recollection was that the text based that's good enough you know and 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 doesn't reflect a holistic viewpoint of 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 how important everybody ought to be yeah you know, yeah it's the idea of, of yeah of the idea of having an equal learning experience really and I think that's mm -hmm. you know really it wasn't an equal learning experience and even now with you know the constraints that we have when we're trying to make uh, learning content accessible there's always this idea of progress over perfection so you know that the the idea that you're going to be able to make something 100 percent accessible for every single type of access need every single type of assistive technology in combination with every kind of assist you know with every browser you know that, that is is something that is you know we're still you know whether we we will ever reach that but the mm -hmm. idea of if if at all times we're thinking of of trying to provide everyone with it with an equal experience an equal mm -hmm. learning you know pla you know experience then I think that that is the key thing that um, you know to take away really but I, that yeah. idea of progress over perfection. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing, the idea of, of uh, if if there's an art part of your audience who are expected to be successful learners reading only, you know, working only with a text version, then why did we spend the money on the other version? <laughs> you know, if, if, if that's if that's a good, yeah, you know, if that's going to lead yeah. to successful learning outcomes, then why didn't everybody yeah. just get the text document, read it through? This e-learning yeah, course could have been an email, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's this idea of, of multiple ways, you know, giving mm -hmm. this idea of, pre of, of, you know, people do have preferences mm -hmm. and people do learn in different ways. But, um, you know, the idea of, of giving everyone alternatives, I think it kind of it links in with that universal design for learning principle of, of multiple ways of, of kind of different engagement and, and interaction, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. Um, there's. Maybe if we step it back just a tiny little bit. So when we're talking about supporting DEI initiatives, uh, okay. diversity, equity, and inclusion, yeah. um, we're obviously talking about when we when we say the word accessibility and is something accessible, we're 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 saying that in the sense that we're we want to include everybody. So we hit that inclusivity yeah. part. 
And I think yeah. it's really it's really easy for folks to immediately think of when we talk about accessibility and learning to think of um, the disabilities. And we've touched on this a little bit already, but it really okay. is a lot more, right? Than just, yeah. it's not just like profound disabilities that we're talking about here. It's about doing, making design decisions in your in your content and your visual learning that makes your learning and your the experience that your user yeah. is having feel included. It, they make everybody feel included in yeah. the, in the process, right? And and how how can we um, you know and and how we do that? And Joe had a great point too. I'm kind of all over the place. I'm not even sure if this is a question or not. But Joe had a great point too about that. This applies to the classroom too, right? Like how do we make yeah. the oh, virtual okay. classroom, right? How how do we make it, everybody feel included? And yeah. in being able to use the tech that we use for virtual spaces. Yeah. And and not only that, but in your design of how you're presenting that course over that medium, uh, you know, how are you making everybody feel included? There's just a lot to it, right? That goes yeah. beyond that, oh, uh, we have to we, you know, the hearing and visually impaired is typically where people think and stop. But yeah, yeah. Again, there's just it's it's such a broader topic these days. And the, and that the broadness isn't always addressed in the 508, you know, the compliance rules and all that kind of stuff. There's yeah, there's these other elements that we just know are are or would be good practices for us to utilize. Yeah, yeah. Is there, is there anything, <laughs> yeah, there isn't really a question there other than or, or what, a are, what are some of the w less common ones that people think okay. about, right? Okay, so I think that's a, that's a really, really good point. And I have to say that for a long time, um, I I kind of thought when I was thinking of, of accessibility and, and, and inclusivity, I did kind of think of them as being more or less the same. And I, I had one of those uh, a light bulb moments. Um, a colleague that I worked with, um, work, she she put together a, a fantastic video, and it was about the difference between accessibility and inclusivity. And she had this fantastic um, scenario of someone who was in a wheelchair who was going to um, go to a restaurant with a group of her friends. And um, she, the group of friends were, um, it, you kind of, they, they went in the front of the, end, uh, of the of the restaurant, but she, it, because she was in the wheelchair, there wasn't a wheelchair access at the front of the restaurant. So she had to go around the back, past the bins, past the smokers, in the dark alley, through the kitchen, past the toilets, and then to her, to her table. So eventually she met up with her friends. And for me, that was the kind of light bulb moment because the the the, the kind of the the um the sort of the, the text under there was it can be accessible. It doesn't necessarily mean it's inclusive. So for me, that was you know when applying that to learning was my kind of light bulb moment because I thought actually yes, you're absolutely right. You can make a piece of learning accessible. You can tick every one of the web content accessibility guidelines, as you were saying, you know, you can meet all of the section 508 criteria, but it can therefore be then that it can be a piece of learning that is accessible for people who have, um, you know, any access needs and disabilities, but it isn't necessarily an inclusive experience. And that for me was, okay, so what do we mean by an inclusive experience? And exactly as you were, you were asking Brent about the type of things that, that, that we can do, it's, it's thinking, it's basically making sure that everyone and we're coming back to that idea, Chris, of, of having an equal experience. It can be a different, but it can be an equal experience. So everyone feels that they're welcome and everyone feels that, you know, they have a place and they've been considered. So some things that that we, you know, we, we kind of like, you know, quite distinct, although accessibility is part of that, it's part of being that kind of inclusive experience on top of kind of making sure that you're meeting all of the requirements that you need to to, to make sure that everyone has their you know access needs are, are all included it is things like making sure that the language that you're using is inclusive that the so things for, that we often have that discussion about whether we should be using um select or click and there isn't a, a WCAG standard that says oh you should be using um select because click is something that will exclude people obviously people uh, who have got motor access needs who might not necessarily be using a mouse will know what you mean if you use click but if you do use select you're just showing that you understand that people are not all accessing 
the, you know, the, the content in the same way. So that's a really small example, but the idea of having inclusive language for us, inclusive imagery. So quite often we will look at, uh, uh, you know, when we're doing audits on content, we will see people have made an, a real effort to include kind of lenses of, of different diversity, but generally from a kind of, um, if we're looking at someone with access needs, it will very often be kind of the one stock image of someone in a wheelchair. And we just think, you know, like to be truly inclusive, it is you're thinking broader than that. You're not just kind of, you know, putting in that one image of a kind of typical, you know, maybe, um, you know, reinforcing stereotypes of what someone with a disability is. You know, the disability is such a, a huge range and, and different types of access needs. So things like that, things like um, putting an accessibility statement for us is, is really important because again this idea of um, progress over perfection it's so difficult to make sure that you're going to be meeting the requirements of, of everybody in your audience but at least if you have an accessibility statement you can show that you are committed and you're doing your best and a great um, piece of advice is always to say it's having a, a contact within your organization so if there's anything that that people are struggling with you know that you might have overlooked or you know because of organizations organizational or maybe tool constraints you haven't been able to do then someone can actually kind of tell you and you can do something um, to, to, to kind of help them so it's that idea of taking it a little bit beyond accessibility and really making sure that everyone feels like you've 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 considered them and that they're included and welcome mm -hmm. Jamie was Jamie in the chat is picking up on your reference to the you know the sort of the, the one wheelchair photo, et cetera. But most of the stock image models are not actually alternative mo mobility users. So it looks awkward to folks that you are trying to represent in the learning. Yeah. 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 And, and then <clears throat> that, so we've done quite a bit of work on that. So there are lots of now um, of, of sites that you can actually get people, mm. you know, authentic that do have, you know, lived experience of disability. So uh, yeah, there's, I haven't got them all in my list to put in the, mm. uh, <laughs> I can certainly share. It, I, it, it's, it's that ring of authenticity, right? I um, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it's like some of us who might work, you know, maybe there's a, something that you do as a hobby or something, right? And then there's a movie or a TV show where someone is doing that. And you're like, <laughs> no, he's holding, they're holding that wrong. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just like you you recognize the wrongness of it. I agree. Like, mm, no, that's, yeah. that's not that's not the way that this actually happens. That's true. But but also mm. with when it comes to that idea of imagery as well, you do have, you know, the, 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 the actually we, we, we've talked before about 70 to 80 percent of, of people with access needs or disabilities, they are hidden. So mm -hmm. then you're thinking, well, in a way you are, again, is it authentic that you're always choosing someone who has a visible disability? Because obviously, you know, within your imagery, you, you, you know, it, people you can't see if, if they have a disability or not. So yeah. it's, yeah, that's another um, interesting angle on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Joe had, jo had to leave, but she did drop this thought um, earlier too when we were when you were talking about, you know, the inclusion as the as the starting point, she said, "Yep, booked an accessible week event at the weekend specifically for a group that needed. Got there and the center lift didn't work. Uh, luckily, we coped. Uh, but if we'd had a wheelchair user, they would have been excluded. No warning, no previous knowledge. So annoying. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we don't want to replicate is that kind of situation in our learning. So mm -hmm. if we say." You know, this is, you know, we're coming back to Brent, your, your idea of, of organizations and, and this supporting diversity, equity and inclusion. It's kind of the, I never know if it's walking the walk or talking the talk, but the one, <laughs> not good for my neurodiversity, the one that you're supposed to do, if you actually are committed and you're showing your, you know, then, you, it, then actually learning for me is a really important place to prove that you do, that you are committed to it. And, and you know, that if you, I've, I've had experience of, of talking to someone and it always uh, this this particular story always um, you know always, always comes to mind is someone who um, I, I was speaking to at a conference and um, it was during COVID so we were we were online and it was he was a screen reader user and he was explaining how he had gone to a um, he'd got got a job with an organization that was really um, you know really committed to um, diversity, equity, inclusion, really committed to employing people that had disabilities. And he said the, you know, the, um, his, his um, when he was recruited, that was all great. He, he could work that work fine with his screen reader. His interview was brilliant. Everything was fine. Then he joined absolutely brilliant. Everyone was fantastically welcoming onboarding. Then he had to do his onboarding training 
and it wasn't accessible for a screen reader so he needed his manager to sit next to him and read out his onboarding training and this was an organization that was at an accessibility conference and were were you know a truly you know committed to accessibility so it's you know like for me that 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 learning piece is so important to actually prove that that you are committed to to um, diversity equity inclusion and you you know you you understand what that means you understand that it means including people who have a range of access needs whether they are whether they've disclosed them to you or not it's it's just making sure that you you've, you your learning includes everybody within your your audience within your organization mm -hmm. yeah it's like because we all know stuff happens right so like in joe's case when the lift wasn't working yeah. right it you know yeah. Stuff like that does happen. That doesn't Please. necessarily mean that whoever built that particular venue wasn't thinking about how do we make everything accessible and how do we, you know, attach all of this stuff. And and yeah. it does it does make it it makes it inconvenient for everybody, but it does make it more inconvenient for those who need the lift. Yeah. Um, you know, and that is, you know, and I just don't. I don't know, you know, maybe they could have like a backup plan in place that they can do or something like that. But, um, you know, I think to your point is just the, uh, you know, the effort and showing that we're, we're trying to get there. Right. I think this, yeah. it's, um, it's hard to make everything perfectly unique and perfectly acceptable for every single person person's unique and individual yeah. needs right i mean that's yeah. the goal that's what we always try to go for with you know yeah. in the, you know uh you know individualized learning and and all that that we all strive for but um you know we're also striving for efficiency and scale right and being able to well, definitely right and being being able to to make sure that our content is um is 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 available to the the largest audience or or you know yeah, even, even if it's just a small group whatever but um yeah. still that it, you're you're hitting all the right spots so that analysis is really important but showing that you're trying to get there is important too and even though stuff happens yeah so that's, i think that's the also the beauty i think one of the reasons that we're I, I i personally get so excited about accessibility in learning is because we do have we have the power so okay i i could go and install a lift or go and fix the lift that was broken but as a as an instructional designer and as a developer i have the power to find out more about accessibility and even if i, I you know many of us have been in a situation where maybe you know for, for whatever reason we don't have maybe the organizational backing maybe the management backing or you know maybe have the um you know the resources to go and get training for example that was one of the reasons that i really wanted to write my book because i wanted there to be a resource that that anybody could find out more about accessibility and even if you're just making very small steps you do have the power you know obviously dependent on your role and where you are on the team but you have the power to make your content as accessible as you possibly can within the constraints there so the more you find out about it the more things that you you understand that you you do actually have a huge amount of power to do something that really does benefit a, a huge amount of people even if you're not quite you know you might not be meeting every single one of those web content accessibility guidelines but you know you everybody can can learn a bit more about it and can learn just do some small things in their learning that really have a huge impact when you're thinking about people who you know who are able to be autonomous and able to you know don't they don't need to go and ask like, as we said in our in our in that um example of that someone had to have their manager reading that they don't need to ask someone else because we're actively giving them the power to be able to learn autonomously for me that that is a huge you know something that when i discovered that i felt well goodness that is something that i can actually change and i have power over even if maybe my manager doesn't think that you know we can have a, a full kind of like you know training program or you know we there there, there are certain, certain things that i can do in my own learning maybe like adding captions, maybe looking at my imagery, maybe making sure I'm not using drag and drops, uh, you know, or all, you know, maybe I'm, that I'm putting in descriptive transcripts for my videos. I can do that. I can have a, a you know, a direct impact on improving um, the learning for people. 
And, and just by starting somewhere, um, you, you know, every time you do a new project, you're going to add more things. Um, yeah. Like, you know, so you're, you're basically, hey, as you've said uh, a couple of times already, we're, it's, it's not about perfection. It's about it's about progress because you have to get yeah. going on this. Okay. So your first project, you've, you've solved some problems. The next one, there's still some places, you know, but basically you're building a checklist then that becomes the ongoing you know, list of things. It's an accumulative thing rather than um, in, in, rather than just one offing it, basically. Yeah, I agree. And, and, the, yeah. and the great thing about it, <laughs> sorry, yeah, go ahead. I think the great thing about it is actually, you know, the, the more I've learned, the more organizations I've worked with, the more people I've trained. I genuinely do think if you the more you understand about accessibility, it really does improve your practice. You know, mm -hmm. it makes you it makes you think differently. It makes you think it, it's that, that idea of having empathy for your learners, putting your learners at the center, something that, you know, we always know that we should do. But when I, when you know more about, you know, people might be accessing this using a screen reader or people might have, um, you know, be using a screen magnifier or someone may be, you know, you know, dependent on captions. You can't, especially when you kind of know people or you've seen that we use a lot of um, of, of um, personas in when we're working and a lot of those are video personas because we're really lucky now that we have a lot of um, you know we have so many videos on on video sharing platforms where people can actually see people using assistive technology and once you've kind of got to know those people and seen them you can't you just can't design and, and develop your content in the same way because you're literally thinking about you know oh but how would that person or you know how would they you know how would they perceive this or how would they experience mm -hmm. this so it really does change you know the way that you that you that you're focusing and also it really makes that idea of unlearning and relearning for me i know some people don't like those terms but it's the closest i can i can describe to what it feels like because you're you're yeah. challenging you don't just you know all the things like oh this is i'm going to do it like this because i've always done it like this it's like well actually is there a better way to do this because the way that i've always done it isn't necessarily going to be the best way for, for for that that person so and it also makes you think you know it does lead to innovation because you're using your tool and every tool has its advantages and disadvantages from an accessibility point of view but if you're you, you're using your tool to the best of its ability you're having sometimes to come up with different ways of thinking so it really does have a, a huge impact on your practice and it for me it's kind of like you know again another light bulb moment is actually this really does make you <laughs> A better learning designer or developer. Yeah, I love that. I, I love um I, I love hearing you say that about the little things and giving us the that we do have some power and we do have some agency to make a change and to make a difference because so often uh we hear people complain about or just you know, that you know, I, we don't have a seat at the table right or we don't yeah. have enough budget to do xyz or we don't you know we they don't allow us to do this or our lms doesn't do this or this that or the other thing you know, there's always a reason right but these things that we're talking about there's so many different things that we can do differently that yeah. it's it is in our control that it's not yeah reliant on anybody else we are the designers we are the developers it's all just a matter of are we willing to to push ourselves and to try and to learn and to to do things differently and have a purposeful reason for doing yeah. them differently so that you can explain you know if somebody says this doesn't look like the stuff that you're normally giving us to develop or that you're normally giving our people to do you can, yeah. you know, and you can with a lot of confidence now with all of the the legal needs and everything say, well, this is why we need to be doing more yeah. like this. And this is why I made these choices. I agree with you. Yeah. So I think the the idea of um, maybe the bit that we're we're kind of focusing on is still that idea of the kind of accessibility being one version and the and the the good stuff being another version i think what the what we probably need to really focus on is this so this idea of actually making learning content accessible we just were talking about making it making it better learning to designer developers it actually does create better learning so i mean when i first wrote the book i had 
I could see that with my own practice and maybe with a handful of people I was working with. But I had a, you know, the huge imposter syndrome of thinking, well, who am I to be putting this in a book when I, you know, because there was nowhere else that I could go to for any other kind of, you know, examples or experiences. But having written the book and having, you know, worked in in my own um, organization and worked with probably over 60 different organizations done um, uh, audits before and after audits, I can hand on heart say that accessible learning content is better learning content for everybody. It really genuinely is. So that's the kind of step between you know, the fact that actually we have to maybe convince people, as you say, there's always reasons why we shouldn't be doing it. We don't have the time. We don't have the budget. If we can convince people that actually accessible learning content just is better learning. So a, a key thing for me is um, this idea. So sometimes, um, you know, I'm sure we're, we're all quite aware that um, you know, e-learning content, digital learning content doesn't always have the best of reputations in organisations. There are things that people don't necessarily always like about it or love about it. And so I have one slide in a presentation, which is, you know, these are kind of gripes, really just, you know, that I've picked up from from my own experience in LinkedIn. And these are all the web content accessibility guidelines that if you follow them, all of these gripes will disappear like that. So I've got, hmm. a, 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 as I say, a, um, a slide that, you know, here they are, <laughs> poof, off they go. Because <laughs> if you're just following the web content accessibility guidelines, a lot of those, you know, people's pet hates about learning content, um, you know, they, they are, you know, fixed. So we do a lot of a, how are we going to fix e-learning content? Well, if we make it accessible, it's not going to be necessarily, it's not going to fix everything, but actually it does go a long way to, to making learning content better. Mm-hmm. Our, our job as instructional designers and trainers, et cetera, we're, we're supposed to enable people, right? We're yeah. supposed to enable performance. We're supposed to improve, help them improve, et cetera. And uh, if we're not, um, if we're not doing that for everybody, then we're we're not even fulfilling our role within Agreed. the organization. Agree, and that that for me was one of the, the big drivers mm-hmm. because I felt like I, you know, I was in an organization where we didn't have you know management buy-in into this is what we should be doing. It was before the law had changed. So we have um, in in the UK and in Europe we have a law that changed in the 2018, which meant all digital content um, in the public sector needed to be accessible to the to the web content accessibility guidelines. You know, we're still a long way from that, but there is, you know, a very clear legal um, precedent now that says that we should be doing that. But, it, you know, as I say, even if you haven't got an organisation or buy-in, it's this idea of how can I be an instructional designer? I can find out all of the, you know, the, the fancy instruct. I can look at gamification. I can look at how am I going to engage my learners, all these things. But if I'm excluding, and like the, the statistics really vary, but, you know, between 12% or to 26% of, of the audience is probably less than that. But then you, you think about people who have got um, undiagnosed or, or, or undisclosed conditions or, you know, so it's really difficult with the statistics. But it's, uh, well, I'd say about between 10 and 12% of the audience, I could be excluding just by not making it, it, it accessible. For me, I just I just couldn't do that. It just it went against what I should be doing as an instructional designer and a developer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you if you were to take say metrics around that and say ten percent of the people were not yeah. able to improve or whatever, you know, then we're clearly failing our job, literally. Definitely. Um, Definitely. You know, in, in, on the the statistics, etc., that we that we need the KPIs, etc., that we're typically measured on. So yeah, if, 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 yeah. And Diane Elkins, who mm-hmm. is a really great advocate for um, accessible learning, she makes a brilliant brilliant point, which is, who am I? as a learning designer or an instructional designer or developer to say who should be able to do their job or who should be able to do their job better. How, who is it? Mm-hmm. How can I make that decision? You know, I should, if, if I'm making it accessible and inclusive for everybody, everybody has equal access. Otherwise I am actually excluding people from being able to do their, their job or being able to do it better. So, and I shouldn't be the one that's making that decision, which I think is a great point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I tell you, one of the things I love about doing uh, it, this show and particularly using this particular tool is the chat. But 
Um, I'm not going to scroll back, but I think it was Kevin that noticed that for for some people in platforms like this, the chat, if it goes by really fast, that's yeah. something that's very, very difficult. That's not very <laughs> inclusive to a lot of folks. The, the, the thing that I love the most is the fact that we all can engage. And now as I'm sitting here thinking it and when he thinking about it and when when he pointed that out, I was like crushed. I was like, this is like. This is why I like using this app. This is why I like engaging such a large audience and and having us have conversations with folks like yourself, but then to then see the reality that some people it's just too much for the the types of um, tools that they're using to read the chat that it just goes by you know too fast um, is yeah. um, is something that's going to make me think a lot more, uh, you know, deeply about this and wonder if there's a way that that can be solved. But I also love yeah. the fact that he's crowdsourcing somebody, uh, as some of the, some of the questions too, they mentioned, can you, can you, um, can you share the e-learning gripes list? And uh, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin jumped in and said he'd start the list. And uh, he mentioned text, text as uh, tech or it text as, as an image, right? And okay. that's a, that's a bad known big no no, right? I mean, okay, because okay. if it doesn't, if the if the screen reader can't read that it's text, I guess unless the alt text says yeah. this image is of the word, whatever. Yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. You know? So so text images of text are quite a tricky one from a from the a web content guideline, a web content accessibility guidelines, because absolutely right. Um, if 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 you've got text which is presented uh, as an image, then a screen reader um, can't read it. So it's a little bit like if you have, um, I always compare it to if you've got slow internet connection and you've got a website that's got, you know, maybe a, a whizzy infographic. If you've got a slow internet connection, all you see is a little square that says, I can't load this you can't load the graphic or whatever mm -hmm. they, they put for access you know for the for the if you're lucky they might have put a label on it so yeah. um that is the same the same the same for a screen reader but the issue as well is is kind of a bit wider than that because also the other thing that it causes problems for people who use screen magnifiers so if you have um text which is part of an image if they if they exp you know uh, zoom in it very often pixelates and it's difficult to read so that's another thing. And also the other reason is that you're um, somebody who uses, for example, a third party um, software or who uses a browser plugin, they should be able to modify the text so it suits them. So you may have seen, you know, the people can change the font, they can change the color, but quite often mm -hmm. they do that with browser plugins. And again, if you use an image of text, then that um, um, is an issue for that. So Yep. But the flip side of that actually is from a learning point of view. So basically, if we, if you were kind of strictly following the, the web content accessibility guideline, you just say, actually, no, you, you, you shouldn't have these at all. However, from a from a learning point of view, and this is sometimes where we need to interpret these these guidelines because they weren't really designed for what we do. They're designed for, for you know, informational and, and e-commerce websites, not really for learning content. So quite often, for example, in the audits that we do, we see a lot of images of text being used because maybe it's a, a kind of a screenshot of, you know, what's, you know, of a system or it might be, you know, there's a whole range of um a kind of marketing collateral that's being used across the organization and that needs to be kind of put into the learning so from a learning point of view in audits that we do we're a bit more more flexible as long as someone provides that text and if it's kind of set out in a kind of you know maybe there's a it's in a you know a circular to show a kind of a flowing as long as that is described in the alternative text and that alternative text allows someone to, so it's not necessarily just the alt, alt text field, which is, is suitable for people who use screen readers. So, for example, what we do is quite often put that description in an accordion block underneath an image. And someone, if someone doesn't need that, that's fine. But if they do find it useful, they can open it. And that allows them to, to see, you know, to read it with a screen reader to, um, you know, if they're using a third party plugin and, and the, 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 the tool is set that they can then use that. It, it means that, again, that, that, that um, image is there. And it's usable for everybody. So it's, 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 it's interesting that that is kind of one of the complex ones mm -hmm. <laughs> that, they, that they chose <laughs> in in that particular um, yeah group. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What um, as we I didn't even notice like time was just flying by. I didn't even notice how close we were getting to the end. But just um, just one final question that yeah. I'm curious about is so 
we have the power to change things because we're the instructional designers and we're the managers. Yeah. But yeah. we all have managers in our departments. Yeah. And yeah. there are those that stakeholders that are a part of, they're the people we serve, right? Yeah. And if you could give some advice to folks and maybe, you know, obviously working with so many clients that you work with, what triggers it for those people to decide, yes, we want you as the instructional designer to be focusing on these things. Like if somebody's struggling with, hey, we need to be doing these things and stakeholders are like, ah, no, just keep doing it the way you have been. Or maybe even your direct manager has like, what can What's the thing that seems to make people besides the legal stuff, right? But, you know, okay. do you have any tips for folks to be able to kind of roll this up the flagpole, as they say, you know, and yeah, convince so others? A, yeah, there's a whole list of, you know, reasons why it's it's great. So there's, a, you know, like as you say, is there's a, the, 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 you're, you're meeting your legal requirements, you'll make it like we talked before, you're making sure it's, um, that learning is um, adaptable for people, different circumstances, different environments. You're, um, you know, you're meeting your the, the right thing to do. Uh, it, uh, so in an ideal world, if you've got, if you can, you know, lock someone in a room and tell them all of those things, then you've then you've got a chance. I think the, the thing for me is is that idea of empathy. So yes. It, I suppose two things. One is that yes, it's definitely better learning for everybody. You know, within your within your organization, you're, you're kind of meeting, you're ticking your um, ED, uh, DEI requirements, all those things. But if you can, for me, it's that spark of someone actually having that human understanding of what it means to somebody to be excluded from a piece of learning to, so quite often the spark is, you know, someone within an organization who has their own lived experience of a disability, very often that, that you know, there's a, there's a huge number of people who have got undiagnosed and are getting more you know, a lot, a lot of diagnoses are coming. I mean, it's exactly the same. wasn't diagnosed with having um, dyslexia until, you know, last year, till after I'd written the book. So, you know, within organisations, that that neurodiversity uh, is, is is really becoming, you know, so so it's it's either it's that spark of someone really understanding, whether it's personal, whether it's someone in their family, whether they've had, you know, they it's the experience of someone in an organisation who explain. For me, that's not always easy to do, but that's the, that's where I see it really making a difference, where I see someone within an organization coming to us and saying, oh, you know, we really want you to help us because, and then, you know, a few weeks down the line, it will be because, oh, actually, I, I've discovered that I've got ADHD and, you know, and I know how it impacts me and I've, you know, I've, I've hidden it from work for many years or, I, you know, I have a, someone in my family who's experienced this. You know, it's that 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 human connection. I think that really, if I'm being honest, you know, there's all the all the reasons that you know I could be here all day and tell you why why you should be doing it. <laughs> but it's but, in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that 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 spark of really understanding the impact it has, and actually, again, coming back to I know at sort of you know at a grassroots level understanding that that you have the impact to do that so if you if you are at a higher level you know if you're a kind of management and and you can um you can really you know make a difference to the whole you know the whole team and, and what's happening in your organization that's huge and quite often i see the spark starting with learning and then we, we, we do quite often we do uh, you know we'll do in uh, we'll do some training and then they'll say oh we wish we could have you know the, the marketing department can they come and then the in the branding and then HR and this because it it but it's it's the spark because someone has decided that actually learning is so important that that is is what they're going to focus on and that is the spark that then goes through the rest of the organization which is great I love it thank you so much for hanging no out problem. with us today Susie this mm -hmm. is fantastic I'm so glad all of our tech gremlins were uh, friendly today and let us <laughs> let us chat for sure it, it, go ahead and drop all of your information and uh, the book and all that great stuff into the chat so everybody knows where to get it this is this is so great okay. thank you thank you so much You're very welcome thank yeah. you very much for bearing with me and having me back <laughs> and, and we'll 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 put in a, also a plug um, we're going to have a special idiotic edition, a special idiotic session dedicated to this topic with you as our special guest coming up in June. So if folks are, are watch their emails, et cetera, we'll, we'll we're going to roll up our sleeves and get into some, get into this, at a, at maybe a little bit more detail as well. So.
I'll give you that slide on all of those, uh, all of there those grape offers. All the grapes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We'll everybody can too, sure. come to the webinar for the list of grapes, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, as always, we do have to mention um, what we get to do here on Idiotic Instructional Designers and Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino Learning Systems, uh, providers of Domino One. We've done a lot of work in, in our offering tool to uh, support accessibility, some really important critical features uh, to make this um, something that you can do better. And so I've dropped a link in the chat or reach out to any of us to learn more about those uh, specific things. Um, it's a critically important thing for us uh, to help our clients do this job better. Indeed. Indeed. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, I think as we go forward, we're, we'll be talking about this a lot more. And uh, because we do place a high level of importance. So, thanks again, Susie. Well, Fantastic conversation. Me. And thanks to everybody in the chat, as always, gang. We'll see you guys next week. As always, the chat's my favorite. You guys are awesome in there. Adiós, everybody.